we're going to focus today on one of those student movements of 1968. It's one that often doesn't get remembered very much. Most people know about the student protests at Columbia or Berkeley in the United States, and others even know that there were massive protests in Paris and in London, uh, also uh, on a variety of topics, but generally against the U.S. war in Vietnam, which was raging in 1968. 68 was the year we discovered that we weren't winning the war. And so um, the rest of the world was not too particularly happy about it. And those events, as we see, are going to collide with a, one of the major events that happens every four years, and that's the Olympic Games. And so between the student protests that happened that year, uh, between the, um, many of the events that drew people around the world uh, in interest to what was going on, they also came across against sport. So this is not really going to be about the Olympics, so we'll just touch on them briefly at the end. 1968, here's some of the, the images of Mexico in 1968. And uh, of all the countries that had student protests that year, Mexico was probably the one that people were least likely to think of as being a large and, and a serious protest. It was not an, an anti-war movement. It was primarily against police brutality. Um, a lot of the conflict started in the, the uh, summer of, of Mexico, uh, summer of 1968 in Mexico City when uh, there was a uh, fight between two uh, schools after, this is how it all started, a fight between two schools at the, after the end of a football game, a soccer game. Some of the local um, uh, other gangs sort of jumped in and got in the middle of this stu uh, student protest and it just blew out of proportion. And eventually coming down to uh, this massacre, we don't still to this day know Matt, how many people died. In 1968, Mexico was the first, really third world country to have an Olympic Games. Uh, Tokyo had been the first non-Western country, and that had been in 1964. And then Mexico would be, and still is, the only Latin American country ever to have held um, an Olympic Games. And so this was a coming out for Mexico, for them to show that they had modernized. So they could show before the world. I mean, literally, you show your country before the world, as, and, you, and you put on the spectacle. We saw how serious China took this most recently. Because again, they were among the, among, except for Japan, the only other country in, the, in Asia who ever put on the games. The Mexico City Olympics are important in understanding the Olympic Games because it's the first one in which politics reared its ugly head, which is now a, totally a part of the Olympic process, it seems, every four years. It hasn't gone away since 1968. So 1968, the city is sprucing up. They're, they're, they're fixing up all the infrastructure. They're showing off what Mexico has accomplished in the, um, the previous 58 years, because starting in 1910, Mexico had gone into a revolution and had throw out, thrown out the old uh, and brought in the new, which was very much like the old to start with. And, um, but they had a revolution. They saw themselves as a vanguard of one of the um, revolutionary countries in the world. They proved that they weren't under the thumb of the United States because they had relations with Castro, even though their government was often spying on the Cubans for us and giving us information about them. And so, again, 1968. Oops, a little too far here. The student protest that I talked about, again, began over police brutality. The police responded to that student riot by, by chasing students back to their schools, breaking down the doors of the schools, and beating students up. Now, in Mexico, schools have traditionally had a, a kind of an immunity from, uh, the, from the government. And this was, the, the government was so afraid of protests um, that they, were, uh, they wanted to make sure that students were not being misled and not being dragged into protesting, as they had seen in Paris, where the students had barricaded the streets, literally torn up the streets, put up barricades, and then, and then looked like they were going to overthrow the government, but in the end it didn't work out that year. So the police overreacted, and it was the overreaction that caused the next level, which was the protest at Plate Loco, among others. Um, the protests continued. Um, they came. Um, they they, they uh, met in the um, in the square, as you see here. That what they're talking about is freeing political prisoners. Mexico only had one serious political prisoner in 1968, and that was um, a guy who had been the head of the railroad workers' union ten years earlier, who had led up a, a strike, and so they locked him up. And so they were they were finally the students were who were really only interested in the, protecting their their student rights began to talk about the bigger issues, in this case, freeing political prisoners and getting the government to back down on its, on, um, its sort of overreaction. 
the, of the really big uh, protest took place in July 1968, on July 26th, in fact, which was the anniversary of the Cuban Revolution, and the, the government was sure that that was the reason why those protests were taking place that day. Um, it was, I think it's also Fidel Castro's birthday. And so uh, he, he was sure, the government, the president was sure that Castro was behind everything. There was a, a, a massive a protest in what's called the Zocalo, which is the second largest public square in the world. Only um, Tiananmen Square is larger. And uh, the government's response to this was basically to bring in uh, tanks and so on. President Ordaz was sure that foreigners were out to destroy Mexico or to show Mexico up. Now, Mexicans traditionally, Mexico's government and people for this, this period are predominantly what we would call xenophobic, in the sense that foreigners can't be trusted, foreigners are, xenophobia means fear of foreigners. And especially what Mexicans don't want are foreigners criticizing their country. The government of Mexico, which had been since 1929, had been a one-party state. Uh, they called themselves the Institutional Revolutionary Party which is institutional revolutionary, don't make any sense, but that didn't stop them from using that term. They were mutually contradictory. And so what, what they were for is they were for keeping themselves in power and keeping everybody else out. If there had been student protest groups before, the government would simply incorporate them into the, the political party. If the Indian peoples were protesting, they would create a committee for Indian peoples and bring them into the party. If there were workers that were striking, they would create a workers' committee and bring them into the party. And so their job was to include everybody. And the one group that they hadn't really figured out on how to include were students. Because when they brought people in, they either bought them off or they made them disappear one way or another. And students couldn't be bought off uh, originally. And uh, there are student groups today that are part of the political parties. But in those days, students were, were sort of feeling their oats. And they were, they were trying new things. And Mexico had a brand new middle class that had grown up since the 1940s. And not like the United States, a lot of young people who had a lot of money, and they were the first generation to go to college. And so the, the politic, those in power didn't quite know how to deal with them. So they were sure that if there were student protests, it had to be something that maybe the students at Berkeley were directing them to do this, or maybe the students in Paris were. And they were sure there was a gigantic conflict in fact, if you, if you arrive from the United States as a student, even going on, on, a, um, on, a, on a, like something like a spring break or something like that, you, could, you were being followed and you were being watched. And every student organization had informants in it because the government was sure that there had to be some sort of conspiracy going on. In the, uh, the response, as I said, in, the, in this, the central square in the Zocalo were tanks and that shocked the people. Uh, and uh, the government also used the riot police, the, called the Granaderos, to go out and break into a lot of the schools. And you, the, some of the schools, were, they took battering rams to bash down the doors, and they arrested not just students, but teachers, because the teachers were behind all of these protests, they were sure. And it was um, at the, uh, the plaza of the three cultures, Tlatelolco, and the students had only gone there to discuss a hunger strike. They had, they, they had tried to meet with the government, and the government had wanted them to basically back off and be invisible. Why? Because there were a lot of foreign journalists in town. The Olympics were only a week or so away. And again, Mexico didn't, doesn't want to air its dirty laundry in front of anybody else. So the Plaza of the Three Cultures. Let me show you some pictures of what it looks like today. The three cultures are the ancient uh, Aztec culture, the, the Spanish colonial culture, and which we've just been teaching and learning about in my Latin American class, and then modern Mexico. So we have the, the Aztec, the Spanish, and the uh, Mexico today. This area today is surrounded by lots of these sort of cheap con uh, fabricated government buildings. A lot of schools were built in the neighborhood. A lot of middle class people live there. And many of these people had also come to the protest meeting because they were unhappy about what was going on. And they weren't serious protesters, but they just wanted to see what their kids were up to. Or they, the, a lot of the local high schools also showed up to see what was going on as well. Uh, the plaza looks pretty much the same as it did at the time. Uh, there are the, the Aztec ruins here. And what makes the uh, Aztec ruins interesting is this is the last part of the ancient Aztec city that surrendered to Cortez. The part in downtown Mexico City uh, was pretty much destroyed, but this was the last area where the last emperor, Cuauhtémoc, fought to the, the bitter end.
It was also, of course, the, famous, the most uh, famous marketplace in Mexico City. It was the original swap meet, the Tiangas uh, was there, where you could literally buy and sell any, anything. Uh, this, of course, is a monument to the last defense there. It says on the 13th of August in 1521, heroically, the heroic defense of Cuauhtémoc, he, here he fell, defending Tlatelolco to the power of Hernán Cortés, and it says this was either a triumph or defeat, but it was the um, sad or, um, uh, birth of the, people, the, of the mestizo people of Mexico today. So uh, this was already, they had already acknowledging this as their cultural heritage, that Tlatelolco was important, they wanted to remember it. And um, also there's the Church of Santiago that's there, and you can walk among the ruins. There's, a lot, there's also a broad plaza between the church and some of those uh, buildings there. The one behind it played a large part in the uh, massacre. It's called the Chihuahua Building because it's named after the state of Chihuahua. And there's apartments basically for office workers and so on. Um, and here's that broad plaza where a lot of this took place. And that's the monument that the government put up 25 years after the event, uh, with, after being prodded by people for 25 years. They still haven't acknowledged how many people died on this event, though. Uh, on October 2nd, the uh, students came there for a protest meeting. It was, uh, the government had pretty much already made up its mind what they wanted to do. And one of the problems with the, the Plaza of the Three Cultures is that you very easily could block off all the exits. There is, uh, today, of course, it's limited because you go there, if you go there to, to, view the, um, to view the ruins, there's only really one way in or out. And so, the, um, the soldiers, the students were used to, at this point, after a summer of protest, were used to seeing soldiers around, so they weren't particularly worried about it, as were the families. People, families were wandering in, bringing their kids. Um, there was all kinds of things going on. And um, the events, though, as, as they happened, we just happened to, 20 years later, we discovered that the government had secretly videotaped it or uh, filmed a lot of it, so I'm going to show you the film. That, uh, that has come up. This was shown on NPR a few years ago, or at least it was uh, on, used on um, both the BBC and the, not on the radio, of course, but also on uh, PBS. The government had, had clearly designs on stopping whatever was happening here. They were afraid they were getting too close to the Olympics and there were too many people. There were four foreign journalists here that day. They had been originally sports journalists, so they had just wandered over to see what was going on. And so uh, this is the plaza. And again, this is 1968 quality um, video. Now, there, on this building, there was, on, what's on the fourth floor, we, they call it the third floor, but on the, on the fourth floor, there was um, speakers, and there were um, the student um, the organizers. They weren't leaders in a sense, because people weren't necessarily following leaders. It was more of a spontaneous thing. But they also didn't realize that amongst them, there were provocateurs. There were, there were police spies and so on who were there as well. And um, there was also apparently a detachment of the president's private uh, security force called the Olympia Brigade, which had been named after, for the, after the Olympics. And so you're gonna, you won't really see them, but you'll see the, the events of what they helped to, to do here. This is before the events. It's about 6.15 that the shooting starts. And this is about 5.30 or so. All kinds of people just hanging out. The military starts to arrive, that's at uh, 4.55. You thought all the old cars were in Porterville. <laughs> they came with riot gear and with bayonets, blocking off again, let, not letting people come in, and they definitely did not let people come out. 6.14. Something strange happened. A helicopter appeared overhead and started dropping flares. That was the signal that the government had set for beginning the massacre. What happened was that from that building, uh, snipers, a num number of the buildings here, there were government snipers. And the first person they shot was one of the generals of the soldiers that were in the plaza. To, to, well, because they had to prove that the students were the ones who did this. And so they, they had these snipers sort of undercover. And uh, we, we learned about this much, much later. Students suspected this, but the proof came out many years later. Um, and they always said, well, we were fired on by the students. And of course, there were no students with no guns, but that didn't stop anybody. And so what happened is people are trying to leave, and there's no place to go. 
And the military, is, this is their moment to come in and go after people. And some of the, the, the people, and this is the, where, the, where, the, where the student leaders were in this one um, uh, large window here. And you'll see they'll circle it. There were, at this point, all the people up there were, were captured and government snipers started shooting from there so they could say that, well, it's again, it's the students who are doing the shooting. So you'll see a bullet flash, or a, a rifle flashes here in a minute. This is the government's own video. So people were actually rushing back and forth and they couldn't get out. They were, some were being trampled, some were being bayoneted, so they were being called all kinds of names by the soldiers. Uh, the soldiers generally came from poor families and uh, didn't have any sympathy for these middle class students and what they were having to go through. Unfortunately, we only have a small amount of this video, but because the government has always had its side of the story. Today it would be somebody with a cell phone. Some people are dead already, some are shot. A lot of people are being rounded up as they, as they leave the plaza area where they are being, uh, they're being captured. And uh, being, um, those that were wounded plus a lot of those that were killed were whisked off in vans and nobody ever saw or heard how many people had actually died. This is the next day. They've already cleaned up the plaza, they've already removed all the bodies. There's stories of what they did in, later on in Argentina and Chile which they simply took bodies out to the ocean and dumped them. 100 miles off the ocean. Uh, they, are what, they are what are called in Latin American history, they're called the desaparecidos, the disappeared ones. If a lot of families were not permitted to ask about their, their students, they weren't allowed to ask about it because to ask about it meant that you could be rounded up and you were, you were an anti-government supporter and stuff like this. What we do know is that, and here again, this is a, a classic photograph from the Museum of 1968 today. It shows the bullet holes, and there's bullets going up. Well, these are soldiers are shooting at the windows. Um, and not only did they go after the people there and the people that escaped, they went after, in the evening, they went to all of the homes of anybody around here and rousted everybody out looking for runaway students or people who had tried to escape them. And anybody who, was, who uh, had put them up or protected them, they also were rounded up and taken away. Students were beaten. Uh, this, this is the example of the, uh, what, the one white glove. They said there were a large number of soldiers and members of the Olympia Brigade who had on one glove, and that was the symbol of that they were, they were on the government side and you weren't supposed to shoot them. So the snipers were, were not to touch the people with the one white glove. No, it was not Michael Jackson. <laughs> had no sequence on it. But here you can see, in both pictures, you see people wearing that one glove, which is very bizarre. And then many students reported hearing um, soldiers screaming at some of the guys, especially on that one window where the, where the leaders had been screaming, saying, I've got a white glove on, don't shoot me. You're supposed to shoot them, not me. So students were rounded up, they were beaten, they were humiliated. Um, they stripped all of them down to their underwear, put them up against walls, men and women, and they, though they did segregate them. And the soldiers used this as an opportunity to sort of get back at these spoiled children. And we saw some of this also in the, in the 1960s and the early 70s here in the United States as well, where there was a sort of class differences that came out. So this is, of course, one of the classic pictures. They're forcing this guy, you know, he's, we're going to get his hair, we're going to get him. So they took like a, like a knife and they started cutting the guy's hair off whether he wanted to or not. And, and many of the prisoners did, were in fact shot in front of the others, uh, at least according to the testimony of the people that were there. And they were, they were forced to stand like this until about midnight. Remember, they, they had been captured sometime after six o'clock and they were held, made to stand like this for five or about five hours while they were beaten and punched and hit and kicked and so on. They also, there's these classic photographs of all these lineup of these dangerous radicals that we have here. 
See, they're generally middle class students, and these are all the, a lot of the teachers and the lawyers and doctors in Mexico today, and they all remember all of this. Of course, the, uh, the, the newspapers, which are generally under the control of the government, are talking about it's their, their object is to frustrate the, the 19th Olympic Games, and so on, in the top one here. And of course, the police were only responding to the violence. They didn't initiate it. Another classic one, and our government uses this periodically, foreign terrorists. Blame everything on foreign terrorists. Even a year later, the president was still talking, the president of Mexico was still talking about how it was, it was really a foreign plot to bring all these and embarrass Mexico in the eyes of the world. Actually, it was the government's actions that embarrassed Mexico. But they were so sure that it had to be foreigners behind this because Mexicans wouldn't rise up against the government and protest anything because they're a happy country. Um, again, again the, rounding, the rounding up of people in the neighborhood and uh, intimidation of others to inform on people is part and part, parcel of the process. These are all pictures, again, from the museum that's now been set up on the 20th anniversary. They set one up at Ponte Loco to remember the massacre. Here's those dangerous radicals again. Just ordinary college kids of, of the time who were inspired by the same things that inspire people and new careers and so on. We don't know how many people actually died. The government said originally only three, then it was nine, then it's, I, on the monument I think it's listed as 34 or something that they finally acknowledged. Um, the first reports out by the BBC said between three and four hundred. Uh, that one sports reporter who, who got the, the, the headline in, in London the next day on this, which of course is what Mexico didn't want, said pro over a thousand died. And uh, so most estimates today uh, by fairly conservative people are at least 300 and well over 900 by those who are clear to see some sort of conspiracy. Again, some students after this were locked up for years and there was, there was um, efforts by the government to go after anybody who protested well into the 1970s. And so there was really no chance for people to bring the government to, to bear on this. Again, these same pictures and says assassins, what's happening in Mexico, and so on. These were from newspapers that were not under the government's control. Of course, the Olympics went on one week later. And in uh, the Mexico City Olympics was one of the greatest, when the U.S. had one of its greatest teams ever there. The, the Soviets were really competing for the first time, so it was seen as a great Cold War confrontation. Bob Beeman's famous long jump took place at that Olympics, the first Fosbury flop and a number of these other kinds of things, if you're old enough to remember that. Um, some of you, of course, don't. Uh, but um, the, what Americans only remember is this. And this for Americans sort of uh, got everything out of the way. This was the, uh, for, this was the black power salute. Many black athletes leading up to the Olympics had actually threatened to boycott it. A, a, a San Jose State College professor by the name of um, uh, Harry Edwards, he's now at Berkeley, and this is when it was still a state college and not a state university, had tried to organize a black boycott because Martin Luther King had been assassinated back in April. And, um, and so, um, in protest against the um, racial policies and conditions in the United States. The other reason there was a massive pro they, there had been a, a potential massive protest is that the Olympic Committee had wanted to include South Africa at the time, and South Africa is not the multiracial country that it is today. It was an apartheid country which kept black athletes from participating, whites and blacks legally separated. Under, with, under Mexico's protest, though, the Olympic Committee changed its mind and, allowed, and banned South Africa. It's the first time a country's been banned from the Olympics for political reasons. And, um, but, so the U.S. athletes came, but they still decided to do the protest during the, the playing of the Star Spangled Banner. And so that's what Americans remember. These guys were actually kicked off the team, and they were forced to go home early. They were not allowed to participate in any of the other ceremonies that came after this, including the, the final ceremonies. And uh, they were some of the greatest 400 meter uh, runners in the world at the time. As I said, they set up a meeting, uh, a museum finally in, uh, in, at Flauta Loco on one of the buildings where it all took, took place. And I toured there last summer, not this past summer, but last year on the 40th anniversary. One of the most important um, um, 
exhibits is the fact that what people remembered about seeing them after the bodies had disappeared was that they literally saw the remnants of everybody who had been there, shoes especially, as a symbol of... Uh, it's also very similar to what I've seen at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where, where it's the shoes of the, of the victims that tell you that there were people here and that they suffered some horrible experience and that we can't just ignore it, we can't just pretend it didn't happen. And um, so they do remember that. They also, uh, as I said, erected this monument, which today you see families hang out and sit by, and maybe some understand what it's all about, maybe some don't. And they, in a few years, uh, uh, back in, uh, in 1999, they also did a reenactment of what it was like to try to um, encourage people to understand what had happened 21 years ago, or 31 years ago at that time. Um, one of the, the effects of this was that Mexicans never quite trusted their government again. Uh, up until this point, although they, many knew that the government, in fact, had um, was not the perfect government that it often said it was, people tended to focus on, well, I'm making money, the economy's good, uh, we're going through the Mexican miracle, Mexico City's being beautified, and all of this. And so the the, the sort of the curtain of development kept people from really looking at, and, and arguing about whether their government was serving their needs or not. After this, they began to doubt it. They began to start saying that we can't trust the government. The government's lying to us. Everything they say is a lie. Every story they've told, including the ones they tell today, are lies about this. Um, they hoped, this was the beginning of the end of the PRI as the, um, the one-party rule in Mexico. It took many years. It was not until the year 2000 that the PRI was finally defeated. They may have been defeated earlier, but the government cheated and lied about the election results. But eventually in 2000, they, could, they, they couldn't cheat. There were too many people watching from the outside. And they lost the election that year. And everybody said, now we're going to find out what really happened at Plata Local. Unfortunately, the president, uh, Vicente Fox, and the subsequent one, Calderon, are both fairly conservative. And they don't believe in prosecuting former government officials, and so in the end, uh, really, not, they said, well, it's, it's past the, uh, um, the um, statute of limitations. Of course, there, there should never be a statute of limitations for murder, but um, they have done this. They actually in, uh, did put the uh, former president, Ordaz, and his um, secretary of gobernación, which is like the attorney general, they, they arrested them, and then they dropped the charges. They said, it's too late too long ago, nobody remembers, and the government really wasn't serious about doing it, even with a different political party in power. But the people of Mexico have never forgotten. This is what it says, never forget the 2nd of October, neither jail nor oppression will keep us from our struggle. Now, I don't know whether the struggle's still going, but they are, in fact, not forgetting. And the result is Mexico has finally achieved a, a multi-party state. It's a small step, maybe someday somebody will come clean about what really happened. So, any questions? Part of it was that um, somebody talked about it and, and, and that it, it, um, a journalist began to search for it and then somebody, was, somebody then um, opened it up and told the story about that. The other thing is that the, the, um, the National Security Archive, which is a, a, a U.S. A, um, um, organization that tries to get the um, Freedom of Information Act, using the Freedom of Information Act to get um, uh, information, uh, from that's, that's been classified, went after U.S. government sources, and we found that the U.S. had all kinds of sources about what had happened there. The CIA had reports, because Lyndon Johnson was visiting Mexico later in the year, and they wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to be in danger from these student radicals. And, most, and, and when the U.S., when the, um, the, um, uh, these kinds of U.S. sources were declassified and, and put out there, and suddenly we said, oh, we've got this video over here. So there is, a, there is a site for this, if you want to look it up, that shows a lot of the declassified CIA documents. It's called the National Security Archive, if you do a search on the web, and you can find, among other things, the US um, uh, um, reports about what happened in Mexico. Between those reports and Proceso magazine, which published a lot of the Mexican files about this in the last couple of years. Uh, 2003, I think it was the 20, the, 35th anniversary is when most of this was published. So, somebody somewhere though had to 
people began to die off, and that was the people who had been holding on to some of this stuff, and, and they you know, the, it began to slip out from the screen of, you know, we're going to obfuscate anybody finding out what really happened. So, other questions? Yes. Well, the government's count was totally made up, whatever it was. I mean, they first said it was five, then they said it was nine, then they, they, they started saying, well, maybe it's only 20. In the end, enough people came forward and said, my son never came home. My, my daughter, I don't know where my daughter is. Some people were locked up in jail for years and nobody knew they were in jail. It's, 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 as I said, they're literally known, it's, Mexico pioneered the idea of the desaparecidos, the, the, the disappeared ones. I mean, the Chilean government under Pinochet did the same thing in the, in the early 70s as did the Argentine generals. So anyway, we were just about running out of time here. We have time for one more question before letting you go. Anybody? All right, thank you much for coming. Thank you.